time to investigate the investigators who don't investigate. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics World and latest posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm joined by Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party. Hi Robbie. Hi Martin. Good to have you back on again and uh, another important conversation all about, well, <laughs> who's looking at the people who should be looking at things that are actually financial service related, okay? <laughs> yep, no it is and we're going to, this has been um, brought on by the what will go down in history as the Adams Report, produced by our mutual acquaintance, uh, John Adams. I should say it's more than an acquaintance. He's a good friend and collaborator. Um, but John has identified a real failing of the regulator, ASIC, who, which has become a sick joke. Um, and its job is to, in 2016, uh, Morrison called it the tough cop on the beat, right? Well. It doesn't, John's report shows it doesn't investigate. So we need to get an inquiry into ASIC. And what we need from this discussion um, in terms of the viewers is bring forward the people who are victims of ASIC out there. Get them involved. We need them to start contacting members of parliament. You've got to remind people of the of the the um the horrible cases. Um, what I find with ASIC, I think you and I might have been talking about this earlier, Martin. What I find with ASIC is it's a trigger word yeah. for um, for people who have PTSD from being victims of financial crime. As soon as you say ASIC, it's it's a meltdown because the universal experience of ASIC is bad, bad, bad from the consumers who have been the victims of financial criminals. So um, there's a real problem here. It's been exposed. Now we've got to have an inquiry. Yeah, and Robin, let me just make the point. This is this is old news in a way, isn't it? Because in fact, there have been some very laudable attempts from a lot of other parties over the years to try and get this ASIC issue out in the open. But so far, they've been able to sort of weave and dive and go around the houses and get protection from the political establishment. Um, but this is a long-term problem. Well, no, you're right, and and the problem is. Another one of our favourite themes, uh, Martin, it's the neoliberal era that we're in has been the problem, right? So I want to highlight a, an example of what you're talking about. Denise Braley, the great Denise Braley, who has spent 25 years in hand-to-hand -hand combat with um, ASIC on behalf of financial victims. Um, back in 2007, 12th of May, she did an interview with Glenn Wheeler on Radio 2UE. and I'll just read you the opening of the interview. Uh, Glenn Wheeler says, Denise has been keeping a close eye on what's been going on. ASIC claim they have pretty good success rate when it comes to prosecuting people who do the wrong thing. What do you say about that? And Denise replies, just sticking to the facts here, Glenn, all we have to go on are the ASIC annual reports tabled in federal parliament. ASIC claim 95% of cases investigated were successful giving you the impression that ASIC has a fairly solid report card. However, the latest figures are 12,500 complaints against financial services and products per year, which is a blowout from 6,000 complaints recorded six years ago. The 95% they're referring to are actually 18 cases taken to court, whereby 17 persons were jailed. We're talking about a situation whereby only a small number of prosecutions take place involving criminal charges. This was grand theft of millions of dollars of retirement monies. You currently have 30 people per annum being charged, to which 18 attend, to co attend court. Um, if ASIC takes criminal action, that represents only 0.2% of complaints. The very serious, very, very serious complaints of the millions missing, uh, missing millions of dollars. People are not just losing 1% to 2% of their savings. They are losing 100% the day they invest. So she identified then, it's slightly different, well, it, it's in the same direction that what of what um, of what John, fifteen years later, has brought to the fore. But Denise's point was they got this tiny rate of prosecutions in terms of their complaints. What John has showed, um, looking at essentially the same thing, fifteen years later, is zero improvement. It's actually got worse because he's he's pointed out in his report they're not even investigating. Denise was talking about prosecutions. 
ASIC is not even investigating. It's a 0.74% rate of investigations of their complaints. This is not a regulator that, in, that has any intention at all to be a tough cop on the beat. This is a regulator, which is a Chicago cop under the reign of Al Capone. And go watch the movie The Untouchables if you want to know what that was, what that was, <laughs> right? That's why they had to set up The Untouchables because all the cops were on the take looking the other way I'm from the worst case of organized crime in history. And our banks um, are living high on the hog in this neoliberal era at a time when the regulator, which by, it was the regulator chairman, ASIC chairman, Greg Medcraft himself described Australia as a paradise for white collar criminals. Um, this, this regulator doesn't even have any intention to investigate these crimes. Now they're gonna have lots of excuses, but guess what? We need to hear those excuses publicly. They have to be judged in the court of um, public opinion and to, to see whether they're reasonable or not because those figures aren't reasonable and that's why you need to have an inquiry. But what Denise ran up against and what we're going to run up against now is a system that's committed to the neoliberal model that essentially doesn't believe in regulation, mm. right? They want They want the market to reign supreme laissez-faire, uh, caveat emptor that, so the, the way caveat emptor in this case works is like sharks in the water. If you see, you don't know if there's any sharks in the water, so you don't do anything. You don't you don't send out, um, you know, scouts or, or helicopters over the head to have a look. That's too proactive. That'll cost taxpayer money to do that. So what you do is you wait for a certain percentage of people to go in the water. And if they're not getting eaten, then more people go in. If they are getting eaten, then the rest of the people can stay out. That's how they want the financial system of Australia to be run. Um, and they actually don't believe in regulation at all. You know, uh, Dr. Wilson Sy famously called it fake regulation. And that's why it hasn't changed. But we can't tolerate that. This is something the Australian people have to lead the fight to demand change um, to. Mm, and it's worth, of course, reflecting on the... No, the three the three trillion that's sitting in superannuation, yep, and uh, the significant risk of loss because people are forced, of course, into savings, right? So you you know you are forced to yep. go into superannuation, so you have no choice. So you are within the system, and then of course the system then doesn't protect you. And if you go back in history, you can look at managed investment schemes that uh, fell over left, right, and centre. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of other schemes where, in fact. It was clear that things were actually not right, and it was pretty obvious. But ASIC chose to do nothing. And uh, when they do finally turn around and sort of have a quick look, then they sort of tend to take a long, long time. By which time more people have got sucked in. By which time the um, bill in terms of losses have really mounted up. And you know, th th we're not talking just small losses here. We're nah. talking massive, massive losses. We're talking huge wealth destruction in a system that is designed by definition to protect the corporates and the financial organizations and to make it very hard for individuals to try and navigate their way through this. And, you know, whether you go direct to the market yourself, or whether you go via financial advisors, you know, it's an uneven playing field. And it's all about caveat emptor. Well, you know, Let's be clear, most people don't have the ability to be able to detect whether there's actually a risk or whether there isn't a risk unless you've got the right amount of regulation in play. We don't have the right amount of regulation in play. Chances are risky investments are being made today and we won't hear about them for years to come. Well, caveat emptor is a really, really good way to live your life personally. I highly recommend it. It's a terrible way to regulate a financial system because the minute the crooks know that the regulators are going to say caveat emptor that if you make losses it's your own fault they'll go well um it's it's feeding time boys and that's that's been the story of australia for the last at least two decades um and a bit more and in fact the whole asic era asic was started in 1998 on the back on the back of the um the second financial system inquiry uh, Martin, these three financial systems inquiries Australia had should go down in history 
as defining the most disastrous financial period in Australia, and they should go into the garbage bin for that reason. The Campbell inquiry, the, the Wallace inquiry, and the, the more recent one with um, David Murray. Um, these were th these these were garbage financial system inquiries, and they've de they've destroyed a, you know the any sort of integrity in Australia. And you just got to look at the results. So what you're referring to is since, and this came up at the Royal Commission since 2008. Just since 2008, there have been 200,000 Australian victims of managed investment schemes who have collectively lost 40 billion dollars. That's what we're dealing with since just since 2008. And there were a lot more cases before that. And the reason we know that figure is because 2008 onwards is when um, the Royal Commissioner from the Banking Royal Commission in 2018, uh, Justice Hain, said the government should set up a compensation scheme of last resort to compensate those victims. Right. That, that was his recommendation. And that that gives you just a sense of how systemic this problem is in Australia. Now, um, there's an update on that recommendation, though. Labor, our new government, went to the election promising to have an, a, a, um, a compensation scheme of last resort that includes managed investment schemes, where the majority of financial victims in Australia are. They're victims of managed investment schemes. This is a real test for Labor because Labor was in, was in opposition for nine years. And in those nine years, from 2013 to this year, um, that, that was the era of the maximum scrutiny on the banks in those nine years. It was maximum scrutiny, right? There was a little bit, it, it was in the back of, on, on the back of the, the, the global financial crisis, et cetera. But you had, you had a, a, um, uh, an inquiry into ASIC in 2014. You had other inquiries into different parts of, of the system. And then you, it culminated in the Banking Royal Commission. And in those nine years, go look at what Labor was saying in the press in response to this. It was all hand-wringing, tut, tut, tut. We're on the side of the consumer. We're on the side of the victims. This is terrible. We're going to clean it up, right? They said the nicest things in those nine years. Well, now they're finally in government. Now they are responsible for this. We know they attacked, how many times did they attack Scott Morrison for voting 26 times against the Banking Royal Commission, right? They were going to be different. Now, what are they doing? Well, just go back to the managed, invest, the, the managed investment schemes and the compensation scheme of last resort. Stephen Jones, the, uh, the um, financial services minister, he went to Western Australia. He had a meeting with the victims of Sterling first, and we talked about this um earlier in the year, Martin, remember, because, you know, the Sterling First inquiry is that actually helped John Adams get some insights into ASIC for that and his own and the own his own the package case he was working on um, that led him to look at this whole picture of of how how much does ASIC actually investigate in terms of financial crime. Uh, these sterling in victims, more than 100 of them, they face eviction and homelessness on the street because of, um, a bit in a big way, because of ASIC's failing. Also, Western Australian state government departments failing, but um, we're, we're focusing on, on ASIC uh, here. And uh, the only way they're going to be saved from homelessness is through some kind of compensation, whether it's from the WA government, the federal government, or both, right? Um, and I think both governments are um, liable because... ASIC is the federal government's agency and, and the WA department is the state government's agency. Um, so Stephen Jones goes over there before the election and meets with the victims and promises them that Labor will expand the compensation, because the when I say expand, the Liberals put up a model of the compensation scheme of last resort that deliberately did not include managed investment schemes, the majority of the cases, even though straight after the Royal Commission was handed down in that scene where Josh Frydenberg couldn't get the Royal Commission to smile um, uh, at the time, Josh Frydenberg gave a press conference and said, yeah, we're going to implement these recommendations in full. And the big one they've welched on is including managed investment schemes in the compensation scheme of last resort. So Labor said, no, no, we're going to expand it. Well, they have introduced the, um, the bill for a compensation scheme of last resort and managed investment schemes aren't in there. And Jones, through his um, uh, ambiguous language, is dangling the carrot that maybe they'll include it later, right? But 
people are inclined to be um, not very believing of his promises. Um, a submission for this for this legislation, this was in the West Australian yesterday by Sean Smith, a submission by Choice, the Consumer Advocacy Group, and six other advocacy groups, including the Consumer Action Law Centre, Super Consumers Australia, et cetera, suggests the exclusion of managed investment schemes from the compensation plan is ridiculous given the financial hardship they have caused in the past. Quote, if the government chooses a narrower scope, then the scheme needs to prioritise industries with clear evidence of uncompensated losses, especially for those in communities experiencing vulnerability, they said, like Sterling. Quote, the intent of the compensation scheme of last resort is to stop people falling through the cracks, so we must not design a system with cracks from the outset. So that's their criticism. They're, they're a bit more professional. The the Sterling Group, Sterling First Action Group, what they said in the West Australian is um, pre-election commentary and representations, i.e. the promises made to them specifically by Stephen Jones around the proposed CSLR, unfortunately now appears to have been entirely misleading as the bill contains no significant improvements on the previous draft bill proposed by the former Morrison government. To say we are disappointed is an understatement. Victims of failed schemes such as a Sterling Group collapse are devastated and feel abandoned as the government has torn away the only route to compensation that was touted as the best fit for the situation. Now, that is Labor already failing a test, right? They, they, they made a big deal about promising this and they failed a test. And the media is not reporting that promise broken. The, you know, all, the, all the media attention is on the tax breaks thing. Um, the media is not reporting this promise broken. And the media is not, just like the media is not reporting Albanese essentially breaking his promise on Julian Assange. Um, they're focusing on other things. But this is a real promise that was broken because this goes to the heart. You cannot compensate these victims of managed investment schemes and look at the size of the bill here, which is, like I said, $40 billion. Now, Choice and others have put up a model whereby the banks could fund this over time, right? It doesn't actually have to cost the taxpayer anything. But then the banks, if, if you force either the taxpayer or the banks to fund such a big compensation bill, how can you do it, Martin, without cleaning up ASIC, without saying your failings, have led to this massive systemic problem of losses that now there's a massive bill for, you have to lift your game, right? And I think, and I've thought for more than a year, that's what they're trying to avoid here, forcing ASIC to lift its game and ultimately forcing the banks to foot the bill for their fault in keeping ASIC as a weak and ineffective regulator. And that's why you've got now something that I think people can understand which is actual figures that, that John has compiled from ASIC's annual reports, updated figures beyond what Denise was saying 15 years ago, um, where the, the essence of those figures are 0.74% um, uh, investigation rate from all the investigations. John said on the interview he did with me, it shouldn't be this hard. I'm reading from our press release we put out about this last, last week now. It shouldn't be this hard. Um, but then you got, he got some media coverage last week in for, the, for his report that you would have seen, Martin. And what was good about that is you've now got politicians calling for an inquiry. They're, they're, they're saying we need to look at this. Liberal Senator Andrew Bragg, um, uh, he said ASIC is not focused on law enforcement and prosecution, um, and he wants to look at it. Um, meanwhile, according to ABC, Labor Senator Louise Pratt also supports the push having previously supported a Senate inquiry into a failed property scheme with the umbrella title of Sterling Income Trust. Quote, this report exposes ASIC's failings in following up the growing number of complaints it receives. We should expect better from Australia's corporate regulator. These issues keep me awake at night as I've seen too many constituents fall victim to corporate misconduct with devastating um, consequences. And, and what they've also found in these media reports on it is plenty of people in the industry willing to come forward and say, yeah, this is a big problem. So it's there. The problem's there. What I'm saying is we now to have to turn that into an actual inquiry, real scrutiny. And, and it's not it's going to what will make this different to other inquiries. We have a new government. Right. So in previous inquiries, we're able to force inquiries in the Senate 
while Scott Morrison was Prime Minister or Treasurer, a bigger stooge of the banks has never been in government in Australia than him. Well, Labor pretends to be different. So if we can get an inquiry that actually lays this bare and says this is a dysfunctional regulator, in a Labor government, that inquiry will make recommendations and Labor will have to either follow through on those recommendations or show to the people of Australia that its rhetoric in this area for nine years was fraud, right? And does Labor want to do that? And that's why there's a we've got the upper hand here, but we need to get an inquiry. Mm, absolutely. And just a couple of observations, uh, Robbie. We're not talking here about, you know, losses from ordinary market operations. No. You know? Prices go up, prices go down, people will lose money and make money on the markets, right? What we're talking here is corporate misconduct, where people have bis been misled, where products have been misrepresented, where lies have been told, where people have got back hands to do specific things or say specific things. That's what we're talking about here, right? And it's those conduct-related issues which are right in the middle of ASIC's responsibility. And yeah, and, and the point, point here there is we know that the conduct, the way that the financial services and investment industry is positioning products and persuading people to, to pile into products, um, you know, is full of holes. And of course, we've also, just worth reflecting, the whole crypto area is excluded from ASIC at the moment, right? And we know that there are a lot of people who've lost a lot of money through very bad schemes there and through lies and, 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 other, and other tales that have been told. But actually has just said, well, we don't look at that at all. So that should, for my, to my mind, also be something that needs to be on the table here. We need to have a more holistic view here. And it's perfectly legitimate for people to understand that they might lose money or make money due to market movements, but not when people are actually being uh, effectively misled to, lied yep. to, misrepresented to, all of that bad behaviour, which is frankly endemic in many parts of the industry. That's the reason we need this inquiry and we need it now. And I just want to go back to that three trillion in superannuation. The question is how much of that is actually sitting in stuff where in fact what's happening is not what people think is happening. So this is not just a sort of a back room small issue. This is a really big deal. It's probably one of the most significant and important issues facing ordinary Australians at the moment. Well, let me let me give you two quotes that tell you what you're up against in the, in the financial system and why you need a you genuinely need a tough cop on the beat. So there's a great book that was my first real big introduction to to derivatives. It's called it's called um, Fiasco: Blood in the Water on Wall Street. I'll just look in behind me see if I can see it on the um, shelf there by Frank Partnoy, who's now an ac academic in um, California, but he he worked for Morgan Stanley in the um, the nineties. And he wrote a book about his experience as a derivative salesman. And, and the, the title of the book, Blood in the Water, came from when um, you know, he, was, he was there at Morgan Stanley when the famous Mac the Knife, John Mac, the head of Morgan Stanley, you know, there was a market crash. And the, and, and the words that came out of his mouth to his salesman were, there's blood in the water, let's go rip someone's face off. Yep. Right? These people are predators. The best people, the best, the most successful people in the financial in this in this neoliberal deregulated financial system are predators. That's what you're up against. And then in um, 2014, there was a great debate in the UK Parliament about Glass Steagall, the, the separating um, the 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 real part of the financial system, banks with deposits, from from the speculative part of the financial system, and. Um, one of the pro glass eagle voices was a, uh, a former merchant banker himself, and he said um, he had he, he said the, the memorable phrase. He said, "Bankers are extremely adept at finding a way between the wallpaper and the wall." So what you got is predators like like mosquitoes or leeches or whatever that are instinctively sniffing out where the blood is. And you're not paying attention, and they're looking to stick, the, stick, stick their blood funnel in there to suck it out of you, right? And they're, they're always looking for other points of access. That's the system. So how do you control that? Well, 
How do the police police society? Uh, is there one literally every 20, 20 metres on the street looking at everything? Do all those security, are all those security cameras you see, are they manned by police in buildings looking at everything? No, they're not. They can't. You don't have enough manpower to actually watch absolutely everything. What you have is a system of crime and punishment, right? And and the the laws are enforced. So when someone is caught breaking the law, they are punished. And the police force, Martin, do not get to decide which crimes to um which which laws to enforce. If a crime if if they have a complaint of a crime, they must investigate it. They can't say, oh, we don't have resources to investigate this, or we don't think this is a priority to investigate. They must investigate it. And what they do, though, to make sure that this is a manageable situation is you you have enough people that if they're caught breaking the law, they go to jail because that's to get them out of society, but it's also a deterrent for everybody else, right? That's how it works. That's ASIC's job in the financial system. And if there's no prosecutions because there's no investigations, those predators, they're not got anything else going on in their head and to, to, that's a check on their predatory instincts. That's modern Australia, right? This is a this is an absolutely flawed system. And it's not, I've just said that off the top of my head. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a criminologist. <laughs> Denise Braley's a criminologist, actually. I'm mm. um, good on it. I'm not a criminologist. This is this is this is law enforcement 101. And we have a we have a law enforcement um body here that doesn't even investigate, let alone enforce the law. And it's carte blanche. And those predators are eyeing off that three trillion dollars in super. You know, they're probably looking at the at the part where where the um the, the retirement happens and the and the um the retiree gets to decide do I keep it in or do I take it out and do something out? And right there, that's the point to pounce. Right, and what is stopping them? What is what is giving them pause when they think, "Oh, what sort of products can we come up with?" Um, certainly, ASIC isn't. Now, also, it, it's worth mentioning here at this moment. You know how um, there's an oversight body uh, now of ASIC, right? And they've just they've actually released their first report, mm -hmm. um, and this is the one headed up by um, Nicholas Moore. Um, uh, Financial Regulation Assessment Authority or whatever it's called. And they've done their report into ASIC. It was very, they had a few criticisms. It was very much um, wet letter stuff, of course. And and as I've highlighted on your show and in our publications before, Martin, it's all it's bizarre that Nicholas Moore got to be the person to be to chair this oversight body, the former Macquarie Bank CEO, who himself is a person of interest an actual person of interest in a criminal investigation in Germany about investment banks ripping off the German taxpayer. Yet Josh Frydenberg appointed him as the, the guy to oversee, to police our policeman, to oversee the regulator. But anyway, put that aside, Nicholas Moore's assessment, one of the things that I did notice in it is he, he levelled some mild criticisms of ASIC's databases. Now, I want to make a point about ASIC's data. Everyone knows everyone who knows ASIC's databases know that these things operate in silos, right? And they don't communicate with each other. Now, this is 2022. What, what technical excuse do they have for these databases not to communicate with each other? So that um, as Dr. Wilson Sai raised um uh as one of his experiences with the regulators, he was there at the reg at, at ASIC when um, the law and the enforcement part of ASIC was dealing with a company. That at the same time, the registration part of ASIC was registering that company, and the two weren't talking to each other. Now, that's not dysfunctional. That goes beyond dysfunctional. That's a willful. That that reflects the the intent of the people running the organisation. Right to have such a dysfunctional system, they have no intent to clean it up. And I, I just happen to work in an office. One of the reasons our office works well, and it's a very, very minor operation compared to what Asics in charge of, is because our boss Craig Isherwood for thirty years um, has made sure that we have the best information technology we have, the most up to date computers, the best database, etc. Because we couldn't function without it. Yet ASIC, and that tells me that ASIC, for, for ASIC to be so dysfunctional, it's actually deliberate, right? Um, and and that is a that the good people at ASIC 
they're behind the eight ball when they want to enforce the law, right? And so this this has to be looked at. They've got to account for this. Um, there's 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 a board that there's, there's a board of commissioners at ASIC headed by the chair Joe Longo. We've talked about quite a bit, but but they're like they're like the board. The commissioners of ASIC are the board. Below them are the CEO, the, the equivalent of the CEO and the management of ASIC. The board has changed quite a bit over the last few years. The management level has hardly changed at all. Um, even after the Royal Commission, where ASIC was shown up to be as how, how, how badly dysfunctional it was during the Royal Commission, there's been no changes there. These people have been running this organisation for 20 years, right? And that's why I don't think of this, what we're calling for, as another inquiry. Oh, yeah, just another inquiry. No, no, no. There's a lot. We've compiled the ammunition. We've got what's come out of the Royal Commission. Um, we've got the Adams report. And um, we know the history of it. All that can come together. And what we need now is all the victims, people who have the PTSD at the mention of ASIC's name, saddle up again. Let's get your information out there. Contact these. Um, uh, contact the people. Uh, we've got. A, we've actually got a list of parliamentarians that people could should contact uh, Martin. Um, start telling them that you demanding a new inquiry into ASIC. So we know we've got three politicians that are that have indicated support for it. Senator Andrew Bragg from the Liberal Party, Senator Louise Pratt from the um, Labor Party, and um, uh, Malcolm Roberts, the One Nation Senator, has has uh, just yesterday called for an inquiry into ASIC. So the momentum in the building is there. It's starting to grow. They just need the public, the people who have had this experience, get in touch with them. Um, we can put the list of people and their contact details in the in the um uh, description below, but just send them an email, call them up, mention the Adams report, and say we need an inquiry. All right, let's actually make this happen. Absolutely, and it doesn't have to be a long conversation or deep conversation, no. but really, it's about making a noise to the politicians at this critical time. You know, within the next couple of weeks, there is a potential decision point that we could sort of shoot towards if we're. If we're smart, that's why we're making this show and doing a few other things to just raise the people's awareness. And again, you know, we've proven in the past that actually making those phone calls and sending those emails, the politicians are forced to listen and they do make different decisions because of the fact that we make a fuss. And, uh, you know, this is democracy at work, I guess. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it is our lot in life. We, we we live in Australia at the time uh, that uh, that this problem exists. Um, as citizens, we're responsible for for what our country does. So, you know, accept the responsibility that's up to us to clean the system up. You, you don't just vote once every three years and say, I've done my bit, right? We have to hold these people um, accountable. And if we're not in there making these calls, then the lobbyists that have the run of the building get to have all the say. And those, there's no more powerful lobbyists than the bank. So that's what you're combating. But what the public are always aware of is they get these well, what, sorry, what the politicians are always aware of, they get these well-heeled lobbyists come into their, into their offices. But they know that when, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot more financial victims out there then there are bankers, <laughs> right? <laughs> and there's a lot more Australians who want a who want a fair and honest financial system than there are bankers and, and financial predators. Um, and so if we can express that to them, if we can hit them with these calls, et cetera, create a shockwave. Now, there's a three-day sitting of parliament in a couple of weeks um, for the budget. Now, we, we may achieve an inquiry in those three days. It, um, what we will minimally achieve if we make the calls now make calls, send emails now, is in those three days in the Senate, there'll be fight, quite a bit of discussion about this. And that may then translate into, um, they may not move the inquiry in that sitting, but they may move the inquiry in the following sitting. Senator Malcolm Roberts has called for the inquiry to be started before Christmas, right? So after this three-day sitting, there's a one-week sitting of the House while Senate estimates is on. And then there's a the final two-week sitting before Christmas um, in late November, early December. Uh, so if we don't get it now, we might be able to get it before, just before Christmas. And and then the inquiry is up and running. And ASIC then has to start to account for, like any other person who works for any other business, you know, your results. What are your results here? 
right? Because if ASIC had, if ASIC only ever investigated 0.1% of complaints, Martin, but we didn't have $40 billion lost in managed investment schemes over since 2008, right? We had $100 million lost in three managed investment schemes and the people were compensated, right? And so no one was unhappy. Well, then why would you complain? You go, okay, ASIC has a really smart way of making its decisions. But the point is they have a very low investigation rate and a terrible track record in the financial system. Someone, Something's got to be um, held to answer here, right? And that's what this inquiry would be very effective for. Absolutely, Robbie. Well, we'll put the details of things below because there's quite a lot of information that uh, will help people uh, you know, make, make, those, um, uh, make those contacts. And, uh, you know, anybody who's... Um, been on the on the damp end of the stick when it comes to to, to ASIC and to investment schemes, uh, and also more broadly anybody who believes that we need a proper financial system, a property proper regulated financial system in Australia, pick up the phone and just make the point. Spread you know? the word. Spread the word, Robbie. Thank you as always. Very important conversation this, and uh, Thanks, kudos Tom. to John for continuing and carrying the torch forward. But I also want to, you know, just highlight again. Denise was on this. A long time ago. This is a long history of getting to this point. So uh, for all of those who actually helped to contribute to this point, um, let's recognise that and say thanks. But now we need to capitalise on it. Now we do. Excellent. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.